<laughs> the films of Dario Argento are the most Baroque, most stylish, most inventively violent, most dreamlike, most nightmarish, and most haunting films that the Italian horror cinema has ever produced. Dario came along with a completely fresh view at the latter end of the 60s when one was really needed. He changed the face of horror fantasy. Any filmmaker working in this genre will acknowledge an influence from Dario Argento. I think that Dario can influence people and has influenced directors with his absolute courage at what he can do on the screen. <laughs> no one can imitate that stuff. <laughs> Dario was probably more scared of the films that he made than his audience was. I've seen the guy just shaking and watching his own film. For me, he's the only director in Italy uh, that I admire, for real, the only brave one. No politic, no moralism, no anything. It's art. You just have to watch it and feel it. He's an impressionist. And it's, it's just, it's fabulous. His stuff is just fabulous to watch. Dario Argento was born in 1940 in Rome. His mother was a photographer. His father produced films. So from his earliest days, Dario was steeped in the world of the arts. I spent a lot of time in my mother's studios while she photographed the famous vamps of the time. It's strange, but I do have this affinity with a female face. Dario also remembers his father's influence. When I was a child, we always talked about the cinema. We discussed it constantly. During the 50s, my father would come home, sit down at the table and say, boys, I'm afraid that the Italian cinema is in crisis. This is still true today, but he was saying it in the 50s. Like many famous artists of the macabre, young Dario had periods of illness when his only companions were his imagination and his dreams. There was a dark, shadowy aspect to my personality because I like to stay alone. I like to be alone and read for a long time. I lived in my own fantasy world, created from books and filled with strange adventures. And I would read all the time, but I went children's books. I read Shakespeare. I read 1001 Nights, full of sex and beauty. After this, I read the stories of Edgar Allan Poe, which were my first formative introduction to the world of the occult. Dario eagerly absorbed the dark universe of Edgar Allan Poe. He had encountered one of the most powerful influences on his later career. Poe's fevered, hallucinatory visions were not so far removed from the dreamlike qualities of the movie screen. Cinema was a big thing for me. It meant going into the dimension of dreams. This is what I discovered at the time, and it was marvelous. When I went to the cinema, I lived in the dimension of dreams, and I was addicted to the cinema, completely addicted to it, like a drug. Dario's passion for the cinema led to his first job as a film critic, and it was during this period that his own cinematic style evolved. My films are always visually striking because, as a critic, I liked that sort of film with strong images. 
In fact, when I met Sergio Leone, it was maybe the first time in my life that I met a person who also reasoned in terms of images. It seemed to me like a fantastic thing, new, beautiful. I liked him very much for this. And it was Sergio Leone who gave Dario his first opportunity to work on a film. He believed in me at that young age, even though I was just a critic, and with great courage he gave me the opportunity to write Once Upon a Time in the West with Bernardo Bertolucci. I became aware of Dario's name when I saw Once Upon a Time in the West, this great western that I fell in love with. And I thought it was wonderful when it came out. It was a real big, giant opera. It had some pretty impressive credits on it. Uh, Bertolucci and Dario Argento and, and Sergio Leone. And I said, who is this Argento character? After working with Leone, Dario began developing a script of his own. His ambition at this time was simply to write. Mi vende l'idea, però potrei farlo meglio io, che se non altro... Then I got the idea that I could do it better myself. At the time I knew cinema only in theory, because I had been a critic. However, I felt I could do a better job. So I asked to be able to do this, and it was very difficult. My father helped me a lot, and together we spent more than a year and a half trying to find the finance for my film. The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, Dario's first thriller, also turned out to be his first commercial success. When the film was finished, I talked with my colleagues, saying, this film has been a huge hit, so I must make more giallo films. And everybody told me, yes, yes, I'd be crazy to stop making them. So I made other films, trying to explore my nightmares in this same giallo style. The term giallo derives from the lurid yellow-paged paperback thrillers which were popular at the time. Mario Bava had introduced them into films, but Dario was to add an operatic and graphic style that was all his own. Argento's distinctive approach was strongly evident in his next two films, Cat and Nine Tales with Carl Malden and James Franciscus, and Four Flies on Grey Velvet, which starred Michael Brandon. It was fascinating, very different. It had a style about it that was really compelling. And so I call my agent, I say, this guy knocks on my door. I don't know how he found where I live. You know, this was up in the hills, this place. And anyway, he says, uh, what's it? I said, Dario Argento. He said, kidding? Dario Argento is the most popular director in Italy. I said, seriously? He said, more money than Fellini, this guy's movies. He's, he's unbelievable. There was, however, one small problem to overcome. So the next thing is, I'm flying to Rome. And all of a sudden, Dario comes in, and he looks at me, and he goes, no, no, no! You know, there's a whole conversation going on. I go, what's, what's going on? What's wrong? Finally, there was a, a girl named Patricia, and she was the translator of the script. And she said, your eyes. Is something wrong with my eyes? What's wrong with my eyes? They said, the wrong color. Wrong color? What do you mean? My eyes are the wrong color. It's all about lighting. They go from brown to yellow to hazel. They change colors. So all of a sudden, Dario's got a light, and he takes the light, and he's going, ah, okay, okay. Now we're all settled. Everything's okay now. We'll stay. <laughs> Brandon has more vivid memories of the time he spent with Dario. I'm having lunch. He walks into the dining room, and he sees me eating. He says, what is he? Oh, no. Incredible. And he's screaming and hollering like this. Patrizia, what's going on? You... Eat lunch. Yeah, and in my country, actors eat. You know, we, we all eat, same as everybody else. You know, but you have a bathtub scene after. We know it's canceled. Why are you canceling? It's very bad to, to take a bath after you eat. And I'm, I'm you know, well, this could only happen in Italy. 
Even after Dario became a director in demand, his father continued producing his films. Italian family ties are strong. My father had experience. He made a lot of movies before Dario. So they love each other, of course. And when I joined them in 1973, it was uh, like uh, making together an old family, you know? The three of us together. It was very nice. And it was, uh, nothing is better than that. Their first collaboration as a family was a historical drama, The Five Days of Milan. It was nothing like the style that fans had come to expect, and it was not a commercial success. <laughs> Profondo Rosso came straight after The Five Days of Milan and marked a return to the style of Argento's earlier films. It was also the first of several collaborations with actress Daria Nicolodi. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Okay, who told you? We met at the airport. I was going I to South America, he was going to Africa. And he was unhappy with this woman, I was unhappy with this man. Our eyes, you know, this mixed. Is, as it happens, the victim was rather famous around here. But then we met again for the casting of uh, Profondo Rosso di Pre. While I was shooting this film, I thought, this is interesting work. And I was trying all sorts of new things, really pushing the boundaries between thrillers and horror. I also came to know Daria Nicolodi. It was our first film together, and I started a relationship with her. I stayed with this beautiful and important woman for many years. You want to do it properly without actually cheating? All right. It was a volatile relationship, and during their time together, Dario and Daria had a daughter called Arzia. Dario's eldest daughter, Fiore, from a previous marriage, remembers the two of them well. I was the eldest, so I picked up more of that period compared to Asia. I've never seen in my life a couple loving so much one another. I really fell in love in a deep, complete way. And they were like one person. Oh, no, 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 no. I've got to get out on this hmm? side. The lock's broken by the other door. I'm sorry. She was the muse, also poets and artists uh, all over, because she just uh, makes you think about things. <laughs> oh, I should have warned you about that, see? I think I'm it sorry. was a, a very trouble? good relationship huh? when it was good yes. with them. Even if it was, I don't know, they were fighting a lot, but it was creative, and sometimes you need this pain and this uh, nightmares to be alive. There's no question in, in my mind that Daria Nicolodi like, put Daria on a completely new track. I mean, if it had not been for her and their relationship at that particular time, we would not get Suspiria. <laughs> Suspiria was just a whole other thing. Instead of being a murder mystery, it's a supernatural story. It's a fairy tale, really, a haunted kind of fairy tale. Suspiria was the opening film of a still unfinished trilogy about a coven of mysterious evil figures known as the Three Mothers. Suspiria is the all-time, one of the all-time great horror movies ever made. It's terrifying. It's like, a, it's like a bad dream. It's like a nightmare. It's like being trapped in a nightmare. <laughs> Part of the movie that gets me so much is the very beginning, which opens so strangely and simply, but all of a sudden, I'm in this airport walking with this girl out into this rainstorm. She's trying to catch a taxi. You see these fountains of water cascading, and all of a sudden, I'm very disturbed by what I'm looking at. I don't know why. And uh, that movie is an incredible work of art. Working with 
Dario and making this extraordinary movie with all its color and its vitality and its, uh, and, uh, its, its groundbreaking artistry. I knew that what he was doing was beautiful and very interesting, but I didn't know how groundbreaking it is. When you spend 11 hours with maggots in your hair, you get sort of inured to <laughs> the horror of it. So when I saw it, I didn't have the, the shocked response to it that, that an ordinary audience member would, of course, because I had lived it. <laughs> I put Suspiria in my top three best horror movies of all time. I think Suspiria has got an attitude and a feel and a sound to it that is a true nightmare. It's a real nightmare. Suspiria was the second of Argento's films with a soundtrack composed and performed by the Italian rock group Goblin. It's just stunning, it's that simple little melody line over and over again could create that much tension. What impressed me was the quality of the soundtrack from Suspiria was, was its absolute simplicity, but its effectiveness. In other words, had it been more complicated, had it been uh, the John Williams Mickey Mouse kind of score that you hear all the time today, that movie wouldn't have been half as scary. The scores that Goblin did for him for Suspiria have got to be among the most amazing scores ever done for a horror movie. They are rooted in progressive rock, basically, but they are bizarre. They incorporate not only musical instruments, but also whines and screams and hisses and whispers. And they are so creepy. It's got a little Stockhausen background to it a little bit, and it's got a little bit of rock involved, but if you were going to ask me what, how to classify it, I wouldn't be able to classify what it was, really, what kind of music it was, but it, except that it sounds European. <laughs> but when you put it in the scene where the blind guy with his dog is walking through the plaza, and the music's getting louder and louder and louder, and the dog turns and rips his throat out for no apparent reason. That music becomes very effective. Normally, I go home and uh, I, I write the, the themes, then I bring him demos or uh, or he comes in studio and, and he hear what uh, I'm doing. But sometimes he, 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 if he don't like something, we change. Um, yeah, we can work together. But normally, I, um, when I, I'm in studio, I, I work watching the film uh, and I, I compose just what I, what I think the, the, in the way I, I like to. And if he like it. Uh, I play and uh, um, and I gave him the, the the soundtrack finished. Much of the music for Suspiria was composed before the film was shot, and that in order to get everybody into the right terrorized mood for the scenes that he was going to shoot, Argento would put up put this music on and then crank it up to eleven, and everybody would be shaking in their boots. And it's no wonder that they all look like they're on the verge of a nervous breakdown throughout that film. The music was equally distinctive in Argento's gothic fantasy, Inferno. This time, rock legend Keith Emerson was the composer. Dario gave me free license to do whatever I wanted with the music. And uh, I think in hindsight, when I look back at it, uh, what the music I wrote was a juxtaposition to what was really occurring on the screen. <laughs> When I was composing it, my sons were like aged between 11, I suppose, and seven years old. And I had to keep them out of my music room because it, they wanted to see what daddy was writing. And every time they came in the music room, I said, no, you can't watch this. <laughs> You'll have nightmares. Excuse Dario me. would say, you've I got to, to use yourself. this piece of Verdi. I said, well, if I'm going to do a version of this Ferdy piece, I'm going to do it my way. 
So I actually did it in 5-4. And if you've ever been in an Italian taxi and been bumped around, 5-4 is a very suitable time signature. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Rather than as Verdi did it, was do, 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 do. I don't sing very well, sorry. <laughs> as well as pushing the boundaries of movie music, Argento also pushed the boundaries of movie violence. When you talk about violence in the Italian cinema, I think you have to talk about violence in Italian art generally, and violence particularly in opera, which is the Italian national art. If you print a plot synopsis, even of Rigoletto, it's, it's grisly, it's grim, it's horrifying. You might have some trouble getting that movie past the MPAA. It does seem to be part of the way Italian artists often express themselves. There, there's a, a great extravagance in what they do that extends to extravagant operatic violence. And operatic is a word that people often use when they talk about Argento's films. And the fact that he made a film called Opera, I think, is in no way coincidental. Opera has one of the most strongest central ideas of a girl having needles put under her eyes so she can't close them, so she has to look at scenes of abject horror. This was always his metaphor for his cinema, anyway. And it's like Dario saying, I actually direct these scenes of violence for you to watch them. I do not want you to look away. I have a point to say. What made Dario stand apart is that he really is a skilled craftsman, that he's able to create a film that is so suspenseful and so scary and that this becomes sort of the icing on the cake so to speak is when you get to the you know to the to, the, to that violent punctuation a frequent criticism of argento's work is that the violence in his films is directed mainly against women i've heard him saying that Women are much more fun to kill, women are much more curious, women are much more interesting and uh, uh, in a more profound way there's something with this mother too uh, that's not very clear to me and uh, I don't know what my grandmother did to him but he always saw her as a monster and so uh, he tries to exercise that through his films. <laughs> I'm not a misogynist. When I imagine my films, I don't imagine women tortured by men. In my films, there are men and women who are cut to pieces. All of the leading actors, the heroes in his movies are women. So it's difficult to, to pin him with the misogynistic label, uh, per se. I, would, I think that he does something that is extremely disturbing to audiences and that he couples uh, violent death with uh, almost uh, sexual beauty so that the deaths have a sexuality to them. And that's extremely disturbing to people. I, as a woman, probably should be deeply offended by that, and I'm not. I don't feel that these movies are a blueprint for murderers of the world. I don't feel, truly, that they represent any deep-rooted misogyny on the part of the director. I think that murder is his subject, murder is his beat. It's what he's interested in, it's what he does. I don't feel he wants other people to do it. <laughs> Many people began to believe that Dario and Dario's relationship was being charted through their films. In Profondo Rosso, for example, I mean, she's very happy-go-lucky, she's even singing in a scene. And then, of course, in Inferno, she, saw, she gets murdered in a particularly vicious way. 
And then of course it goes all the way down from there, from Tenebrae at the end, she's just screaming and screaming. And then in Phenomena, she looks terrible, and she's like razor to bits by a chimpanzee. And then in Opera, she's actually looking through a keyhole, and the bullet goes through her head, and she flies through the air. I mean, no wonder she hasn't wanted to work with Dario again. I mean, he's thought of more and more vicious ways of killing her off, because I think it actually is uh, symbolic of their relationship. I just don't know what to say about that, but I do hope that my significant other never puts me in a film in which he fires a bullet through my eyeball through a keyhole. It's kind of creepy. Argento's films seem to come from a much deeper place than most, a fantastic world of the subconscious and of dreams, where logical narrative conventions take second place to a more profound emotional truth. Dario told me he has dreams or nightmares, and that's how the story comes into being. He would write down the nightmare, and it would become the script. I think that in Argento's films, the narrative usually doesn't matter a whole lot. They create this kind of dreamlike space that really, it, it's, like a, it's like being plunged into an incredibly complicated, fascinating nightmare. And it's somebody else's nightmare. Knowing Dario as I do, uh, I think that, that his films come out of his mind. The ideas behind his images and, and the way he, he looks at things comes out of uh, the story that he tells over and over again. There was a hallway at the back of his house, and when he had to go to sleep at night, for whatever reason, when he would walk there, he would imagine these things behind this doorway, of this hallway. And uh, by the time he got to his room, he was in complete terror. I think when Dario gets an idea, he is basically trying to communicate a kind of, um, um, either a kind of horror or an allegory about certain human behavior. I don't think he's the kind of guy that dots the I's and crosses the T's as far as story or character arc. I don't think he particularly cares about that. He's more like Gauguin or Van Gogh, somebody who just says, well, here's the way I want this to be, and this is the world, and, you know, take from it what you will. Dario has also produced and presented programs for Italian television, including a series appropriately entitled Giallo. These appearances boosted the public perception of Dario as an Italian Alfred Hitchcock. Argento was often referred to as the Italian Hitchcock or a garlic-flavored Hitchcock. And I always thought that was a bizarre and spurious comparison because his films are constructed so anti-Hitchcockly. A Hitchcock is the most linear and controlled of directors who has probably ever worked in the medium. And Argento is the least linear, I think, whose work has ever achieved wide distribution and, and any kind of widespread following. You know, Dario does something entirely different than Hitchcock did, only because uh, Dario deals with that, uh, that kind of genre often, of uh, the crime suspense, uh, mystery, uh, guy in the black gloves, murder genre. People associate that with, uh, with Hitchcock, but he isn't really at all. He's, uh, he's actually far away from that kind of cold and precise look at, at things that Hitchcock was, was always doing. He's, a, he's a, a very far away from that aloof, kind of feeling you get with a Hitchcock movie. Dario is very, very different indeed. Much closer to the surrealists, Louis Buñuel, let's say, than Hitchcock. I would love to have a similar career to Hitchcock, but I'm different from him. I'm Latin, and so my films are more passionate. And 30 years on, the world is a very different place from when I started to make films. Dario Argento has written and produced films for other directors, too. He helped George Romero, the groundbreaking creator of Night of the Living Dead, to finance and produce his sequel, Dawn of the Dead. I met him in New York, and then 
I met him in New York and then he came to Italy and he stayed in a beautiful house near the Colosseum. He wrote the film and then I stayed with him while he did some shooting. It was a beautiful relationship and it was the beginning of our collaboration. I wound up sitting in Rome for a month and writing the final script, the shooting script there, which is an experience, you know, because it was all just pasta and caprese salads and going out with Dario at night and big tables, 20 people, all multilingual people, and I'm sitting there like this guy from Pittsburgh with this idea about people, dead people that walk. The commercial success of Dawn of the Dead brought Argento and Romero together again. Their next project involved two stories from Edgar Allan Poe, Dario and George would co-direct. I hadn't heard from Dario for a number of years, and all of a sudden he called me and said, George, I am Dario. And, uh, wow, so we had a great chat, and he said he wanted to do a thing with Poe stories. He would do one, and I would do one, was his plan, and they would be an hour each or 40, 50 minutes each. And we just had a ball, like a bunch of kids playing with electric trains, you know. I think it's a fun little film. I think that's where he met Tom Savini for the first time, or, or worked with him for the first time. Dario Argento? Dario is a star in his own right. God, Suspiria, Tenebrae, you know. He's a volcano of the mind. We would sit there and, you know, create this stuff, you know, and just thousands of ideas, and he was like, picking the best one. And, uh, you know, he doesn't speak very much English, but we could talk for hours with sign language and, you know, charade gestures and things like that. He's, he's, he's just fun. <laughs> Tom Savini has always been fascinated by the mechanics of death. His time in the army taught him valuable lessons for his later career. The jaw is always slack, maybe one eye is slightly open and closed. Sometimes they die with smiles on their faces, you know. So, and that's what I did in Dario's uh, movie Trauma. It's always my ideal to, to put the real head in as much as, po as possible, like when you're doing a cutthroat, you know. Ah! Because the real head can act. The Brad Dorf head was the best. There's a scene in there where the head falls from the elevator shaft and lands on a spike. It just kind of slides down there after it lands. Well, Dario did that in reverse. We actually pulled the head up on the pole a bit and then took it right off the pole. So in reverse, it would go chink, and then slide, and that was Dario's idea. Argento and Savini dreamt up many bizarre methods of inflicting death. The new somatic was also from trauma. Imagine in Dario's broken English describing how this machine that you would put on somebody's head would be a garrote that would tighten and take off their head. He left it up to us, and we just got a, you know, electric screwdriver and, and got sockets, electric sockets, and made something very with, with, with a bunch of battery connections on it so it would have the power and the garrote wire, you know, and it really worked. You'd squeeze it, and it would, you know, come in. Precious. In Trauma, a thriller which Argento also fun. directed in the States, it was actress Piper Laurie's turn to receive the Savini treatment. <sighs> You know, the most difficult part of that is what I had to do before I even left Los Angeles and go to one of those special effects places where they put a plaster over you. And I'd done it once a few years before and thought I was going to die because of claustrophobia. They do stick straws in your nose, but still it was very difficult for me. The actual shooting of the beheading and all the frolicking afterwards uh, 
was fascinating. I'd never done anything like that. <laughs> Dario wanted her head to roll across the floor and say, Nicholas, every time its mouth rolled toward the camera. I was seated on a revolving stool, and, the, and somebody would spin me around on it, and I'd go whirling around so that they'd get a shot of the head spinning. Of course, it was, it was very close, so you couldn't see that, uh, what was really going on. We took the floor and put it behind her on uh, wheels. So they would wheel the floor behind her as she spun on the chair, and they turned the camera upside down, featuring just below the, the appliance on the neck, and she would go, Nicholas. I mean, it's not often that you get beheaded and then get lines to say afterwards. <laughs> Argento's imagination and technical ingenuity are not just confined to killing his characters off. The shot that blew me away was the shot in opera, which tracks the bird around the opera house. And I still don't know how they did it. He tried to explain to me, but I didn't quite understand. I guess some sort of a crane from the ceiling or something, but what an amazing shot that was. I've never seen a shot like that. Crows were one thing, but 1987's Creepers required special effects with insects too. Dario wanted something which looked real, because uh, he, he did not like uh, special visual effects. He wants everything to look strictly real. I shot the close-ups of the insect against the windows, but I said there is something missing, there is a long shot missing, a long shot of millions of flies coming to the house. So we got a tank with water, and we had the coffee, we put the coffee into the tank and filmed it with the slow motion camera. It came out, it was very good. When Davio saw it on the screen, he was surprised, he kissed me, you know, <laughs> he said, that's wonderful. Despite the variety of his work, Argento always returns to the mechanics of death. He's trying to get somebody killed. Somebody stop this thing. Ah! Harvey Keitel, in a fantasy dream sequence in this medieval flashback, is impaled and the steak comes out of his mouth. Ah! Ah! And it wasn't just audiences who were traumatized by Dario's love of graphic special effects. We got a letter from Harvey Keitel's attorney. Harvey Keitel must never be in the same room with the fake head of Harvey Keitel. He must never see a photograph of the fake head. Uh, the head must never be shown to him. He must never be anywhere near the fake head. And I asked him, what was this thing with the fake head? And he said, oh, it would just give me the creeps. You know, he didn't want to see it. He didn't want to be around this fake head of him. You know, Harvey Keitel. Here in the industrial city of Turin, the organized chaos of a film shoot begins. Dario Argento, master of horror, is busy at work on his 15th film. For a solitary dreamer like Dario, turning those dreams into reality is a frustrating ordeal. No, voi no, family. The moment I hate most when I'm making a film is when I'm actually shooting. For me, this is the most irritating, the most annoying, the most embarrassing, such a bad time. Why do I hate shooting? I don't feel comfortable when I'm shooting because I'm a natural loner and I'm usually at peace alone. When I film, it's crowded. People talk to me, ask me questions, and this is annoying. 
But I don't let people see this, and I hope to appear enthusiastic on the set, though I actually hate it. Argento is sometimes said to show far more interest in the look of his films than in the performances of his cast. Molto spesso l'attore pensa è molto egoista. I think some actors are very egotistical. They only think about themselves without thinking that their performances are only part of the film. They forget about the atmosphere, the architecture, the lighting, everything else. They only think about themselves. This is very hard for me to come to terms with. Lately, my father has changed very much with actors. I think it was a thing with my mother that made him hate actors. Probably worked with some people who were not very nice and I don't know. Uh, so he was, when I was little, he was always telling me actors are shit, actors are animals, like Hitchcock said, actors are beasts. And I thought to myself, but, and I was a little girl and I was already acting and I told him once, but I, I am an actress. And he said, no, you're not. Action! Usually Dario just wants to use them and like move them around the screen. He wants them to act, he's, that's what he's paid them to do. Get on with it, he just wants to sort of move his camera around them, do these fabulous shots, you know, go over them, go under them, go round them. That's what he wants to do, he's more interested in that. Okay. He cares less about performance than about uh, just the, you know, the position in the frame and as long as it's appropriate, the expression is appropriately uh, dramatic, uh, whatever. I think that he would, you know, I think that he would probably have a good time working with uh, computer-generated actors. It's surprising to hear that Dario doesn't like actors because I had such a sharing, working experience with him. He was like a child in his excitement. He just, ay, 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 fantastic, fantastic. I mean, guy weighed 88 pounds. You know, he, he, he was thin, but he, was just, he would just throw his body into the air, you know. He, he, just, uh, he just loved it all. He was the kind of director who knows what an actor has to offer and uses the actor's particular gifts and just gently guides him or her rather than um, trying to impose his idea of how a performance precisely should be. Um, so he, he um, I mean, in other words, I think he brought out the best in me, which is always, I think, what a good director can do with an actor. I think my father hates actors that are there like, oh, come on, you have to speak to me. I want attention, I want more. My father uh, sometimes shows the actors, most of the time, what he wants through the movements of his camera. And uh, you have to be smart enough to appreciate that and give your best and direct yourself, uh, you know, be, just be and not uh, act. Asia Argento has now acted in several of her father's films. Through Asia, Dario is actually reliving his relationship with Dario in many ways. They look alike. I think Asia is as good an actress as her mother is. And I think through that, they're actually exploring everything that I think Dario would have wanted to have done with Dario had their relationship lasted the course. When I worked with my daughter Asia, I discovered the muse in her. It's a privilege to be able to work with your own actress daughter without rivalry. The usual antagonisms between father and daughter didn't happen in our case, because we have become friends, colleagues. Their professional relationship was put to the test when father and daughter worked together on trauma. I was so scared. and The most painful thing was when I had to take my bra off in the scene and I had to be breast naked and 
it was a big issue for me and a big problem to be naked, and especially in front of my father. It's just been lately that I've been thinking about how actually bizarre it is that my father has killed my mother several times and my sister once and never killed me once, but uh, he had me raped a few times and uh, it's really bizarre if you think about it. <laughs> I, I, I sincerely don't want to because I'm scared that I'm going to reveal something that is better to be kept uh, like this. He needs somebody, a feminine character, to represent his curiosity of life and danger and all these things. In some ways, sometimes I thought that he gave me life only to have a muse, only to have somebody, an actress for his films. And sometimes I think that. Some people think that Dario might have had even more success if he'd taken a familiar route and moved to the United States. Dario is Italian. Dario is, um, you know, is completely Italian. And uh, maybe he was even proud to, do, to, to be Italian, you know? For an artist, it's better to stay in your country and make your movie from your country. Ancora, ancora. Oh, basta. And then present your talent to everybody else. Why make movies from other countries and make the same things? It doesn't have any sense. I think that East American movie look too much American. I like his Italian movies because they have a different style, a different flavor, which his American movies do not, do not have. So I think uh, his right place is Italy, you know. He makes Italy international, he makes Italy American too, because the, he has a very personal, very special way to look at it, to film it. I think he's probably been given a certain freedom to follow his own vision that many American directors certainly don't have because they're answering to bottom line executives who have a, a crowd of, of accountants sitting behind them saying, I, I think it's very nice this director has an artistic vision, but if we don't have a body every 15 minutes, nobody's going to care about this movie. In a career that has spanned almost 40 years, Argento has become justly renowned for his unique visual style. His use of camera and his fluidity of his shots, I think, have been very influential to many filmmakers. Um, even in some of his lesser films, I think some of the people will say that, look, you know, you're looking at a guy who really knows how to move the camera, knows how to create, you know, some creative uh, shots and creative angles and things like that. He would look at something and he'd think about it. And then he'd all of a sudden go, Machina mano, machina mano. And they'd bring him the hand camera. Così, così, così. Così. And he'd go and he'd run and jump up on top of a sofa. La macchina così fa questo movimento. Così. And he'd walk along the back of the sofa and then he'd jump up onto a table. Così, così, così. And then he'd run along like this, and then he'd jump up on the stairs, cozy, cozy, like this, like this, like this. And then he'd hold it above, like this, to the door, and out. And he'd walk back in, and the entire crew was standing there like this. And he'd go, vai, 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 subito, subito. And everybody, you know, running around, like, not knowing what to do. Two days later, we're ready to shoot this sequence. And they have a cameraman tied on a pole, attached to a dolly, Four guys go like this, lifting the cameraman up on a, on a harness that he's got, holding the camera into the air. Then they run along with this track that they built way up the side of a room so that it could go over our heads and beat us to the door, and we go out. Silencio! Partito! Silencio! He did some really radical stuff editing-wise, too, that people don't really give him credit for. I mean, you know, from subjective points of view to sudden tight close-ups. This had never been done, and it gave an immediacy to the films that uh, followed them.
or when you see John Ford uh, movies, even if you see when it's already begun, you don't know who made this movie, but you see the style, you know, you see the way you're doing the shot, you know, it's, it's very personal. And with Dario is the same, it's a very personal way of filmmaking and uh, I like it. Oh, my friend! Argento is now recognized all over the world. To countless fans, the name Argento has become almost a brand. Well, he's pretty famous in Italy with uh, young people, with the kids. He and I were over there at the Turin Film Festival and we went out to an Egyptian museum to look at mummies, I guess reliving our old Hammer Horror Film days, and he was mobbed by, by his school kids, mobbed. They knew who he was and they were yelling and screaming for him. So he's very popular with the young generation because there's no one else doing what he did anymore. That whole, uh, his whole genre is kind of gone from him. <laughs> When you go to Japan, my father is famous like uh, in Italy almost. It's beautiful to see that he, he reached people all over the world. He always say that he tell a story and, and it's great to, to see that the story he tells is um, interesting for everybody <laughs> in the world. Can we please sign this guy? I'm very proud of, of the success ah, of Dario is. because uh, when I met him, I really loved his cinema. I really loved his imagination, his capability of uh, uh, great technical uh, skill, you know. Uh, so this uh, remains. I can't cancel this. And this, uh, he deserves the success he has all around the world. But he's, uh, he's great to, to talk with, to get drunk with, to go out with. We're friends. Um, we have a completely different way of looking at life and the world, completely different kind of life. Uh, and yet, uh, we both understand the horror movie and love it. And it's fun. It's fun being with him. I'm proud and I'm happy to have made a lot of films. It was interesting to say what I wanted to say and I was lucky to be able to do it in my own way. I am very proud of one thing. I've worked in total freedom and nobody could tell me what to do. If I hadn't had this, my films, of course, would have been very different. Dario's always had his, his uh, always just really, I don't know, followed his gut on, well, this works and it works for me and therefore I hope it works for you and I don't care if it doesn't, uh, which is a, a terrific attribute that he has. I mean, he just sort of lays it out there. I mean, he cooks a cooks a stew and you don't like the way it tastes, tough. <laughs> I had finished the film. I was at the hotel packing my bag. Knock on the door. Scusi. Dad, I want you. He forgot one shot. What shot? No lo so. Come. I'm sitting in the car, we're driving further than we've ever driven to any location. I'm thinking, I don't remember any of this. Where are we going? And it's getting dark. And we're driving, we're driving. The next thing is, the guy points at his big door. It's almost like a castle. So I get out of the car, and he drives away. And I'm standing there in the pitch black. I'm thinking, what's going on here? So I go over and I bang on the door, and I swear to you, a guy with a lantern hands, answers the door, and he goes, and he walks off. I was in pitch black. You know, and I, so I had to like, keep up behind him, turning all these corners. And I'm thinking, I am living a Dario Argento movie here. And I'm getting nervous. And I'm thinking, I don't know what's going on here. Maybe they're going to kill me. Then I turn up and all of a sudden, yeah, there's a big shout. And fountains light up and a whole band begins to play, an orchestra. And it was a farewell party. 
That was the location Dara chose to have the party. It was a fantastic time.